Okay, so welcome to our video tutorial of how to install the uh, EFI Colorproof XF RIP for Epson. Uh, I'm Mark, and I have here with me Larry. Hi, Mark. How you doing, Larry? Good. We're going to walk you guys through um, how to install this RIP. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, we have a Windows XP system here, as you can see. Uh, it's a clean install. We'll be giving you guys an overview of the specs that we require for the RIP. Um, the EFI product actually comes on a single DVD. You also have a USB key and what's called an EAC code. That's basically your serial number you're going to need uh, as part of the installation. Uh, this computer also is on the internet. It has to be connected to the internet. It makes it extremely easy to register that EAC code I mentioned earlier uh, as part of the install process. So you can, of course, uh, register this software manually, but I highly recommend that you make sure the computer that you were about to install the RIP on uh, is on the network and on uh, Ethernet so that it can actually see the Internet and be able to register the software over the net. So what I'm going to do right now is go ahead and install the CD uh, into my computer. Um, this DVD uh, will auto-launch the installer. There's a slight delay uh, as we wait for it to come through. So now that we have the uh, installer for Epson up, um, we have three choices here. We can install the RIP itself, we can explore what's on the DVD, or we can exit out of the installer. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and obviously click on the install, uh, the installer itself. You only click on it once. Uh, if you double click this or triple click this, you will launch multiple versions of the installer. It'll actually, Windows will tell you you've already got a version running. You may notice that when I clicked on it, you don't really see anything show up yet. There's like a slight delay here. As you can see, the RIP is coming up to speed. But you single click uh, the install icon, not double click or triple click, single click it, and then just wait patiently for this uh, language to show up. Obviously, we're going to be selecting English here and hit OK. Uh, the RIP is going through its install wizard. And here's the main interface of uh, installation. We're going to obviously hit Next. Uh, you can read the software license agreement. I'm sure all of you can read that fast. Speed reading. Speed reading. Accept the terms of the license agreement and hit next. Uh, and this is an important area. You really want to make sure where you're installing this RIP. Now, Larry, in your opinion on this, I know we've seen a lot of RIPs installed over the years. The latest version of this RIP for Epson wants to install it in the C directory. This is exactly where it installs it. Uh, and we obviously don't recommend anybody changing that, right? No, there's there's um, a couple of things that go on. Um, one is we, for convenience, we've actually had some links to commonly used folders put into the programs group. So if you install into a different directory, um, those links are going to be broken. Um, it's something you can manually correct. Um, the other issue is from a support standpoint. Um, if you decide to call Epson, um, it's much easier if you know the support team knows you know that everything's in a common directory structure. There are a lot of directories within uh, Colorproof XF for Epson um, that we may need to you know uh, navigate you to. So it's just easier um, all around if we can do that. And, and we'll talk about this more as we do the install. But um, that C drive is going to take a lot of activity during the process of using this RIP. So we really want to make sure that you have a lot of extra disk space on that C drive, a lot of extra memory. And then, of course, it's a decent speed drive, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we're going to leave the destination location alone and go ahead and hit Next. Uh, and then we get a Select Features screen. This is an important screen. Uh, I recommend for every installation that you install the server, the client. Uh, the Job Monitor, Larry, really isn't required. Job Monitor is just really a simple version of what the Job Explorer will do as part of the client software. Right, we'll it's, really, it's really a view only. A view only utility. Yeah. So if you wanted to put an LCD monitor or high-def TV connected up in your shop and you wanted just the job monitor running on that LCD so you can see right. what's going on with this RIP, that would be cool. But right. we're not going to install it. I always turn JDF Connector on because there's a lot of cool stuff that JDF supports. And you know this RIP has a very powerful solution for JDF. So just to be safe, I go ahead and install yep. it because it installs a lot of uh, important utilities that you need to make JDF work. So even if you're not using JDF, you might want to still click on that and install it. It doesn't affect the installation very much. Uh, any opinion on that? Um, pretty simple? Yeah, it's pretty simple and there's not a lot of overhead involved with it, so I don't see any real downside in installing it. A um, couple of notes here. Um, if you're installing the server, um, that's the um, computer that the, that the key or the dongle 
needs to go on. And every time you install the server, um, it will um, install the client. So the client and server need to be tied together. Um, the client can be installed on any number of PCs or Macs. There's a Mac version of it as well. Um, and that doesn't require the dongle. So it's cool. just a, um, something to keep in mind as you're doing an install. So this setup here looks pretty good. Uh, it's what we recommend for the majority of customers and hit next. Yep. Now it's going to ask you to plug in the dongle, which we've just done. Uh, once the dongle is plugged in, and you know, a good point to talk about this, the USB key is the dongle we're talking about. Um, that USB key um, is rarely broken, but if it should be malfunctioning for some reason, a couple things for you to double check before you call Epson. And by the way, you always call Epson on everything when it comes to support on the product. Uh, we'll send you new dongles or new USB keys if there's defective ones found, that kind of thing. Uh, but you want to make sure the USB port you're connecting the dongle into is 2.0 compliant. If you have an older server or computer that is a USB 1.0 port, this dongle will not work. You need to be on a USB 2.0 port. And if you are using a Macintosh to run Windows, um, you want to make sure that you are using the USB ports on the back of the Mac as the safest way to go than the USBs on the front of the Mac. And definitely don't connect the USB key to open USB ports on the back of the Mac monitor or or on hubs and things like that. I found that, just my opinion, Larry, I don't know what you think. Make sure you connect the USB key on the main USB 2.0 port on the back of the CPU itself that's connected to the motherboard. Yeah, I've actually seen that front port issue on PCs as well. So as you go through the install, basically if it fails to find the key, um, the first thing I'd do is basically try another port. Yeah. Um, back, you know, the, the interface, the installer interface gives you a back button. So basically back up, move the dongle or the key to another USB port, and then try the install again. Good. So I went ahead and clicked OK. It verified the key was all right. So I'm going to go ahead and install. And now we're going to go through the install process. Uh, you know, the install process is pretty quick. This installs everything, as we mentioned. Um, this is a good time, actually, to bring up some more information, especially around computer requirements. You know, in all the years I've been in the printing industry, I'm still shocked about how some of these computers people are using out there as computers, as platforms, to install these RIPs. You know, the RIP and the workflow is probably one of the most important areas to speed up the processing and overall networking of everything to, to, to speed up the ability to deliver a proof, but I still find a lot of old computers out there. So, Larry, just give us a quick rundown. What computer hardware would you recommend these guys to be running on? Um, well, the first thing as we started is you really want to run on uh, hardware that's built for Windows XP, and that's the 32-bit version of Windows XP. We don't need 64-bit. Actually, we wouldn't recommend running on 64-bit uh, Vista or Windows XP. Um, so the latest thing is really, um, you know, current generation hardware. Um, current generation being a couple of years. So a Core 2 Duo, um, a Quad Core, a Xenon. Um, you know, current Mac Pros with Boot Camp and XP work just fine. That's a good solution. Um, uh, and then four gigs of memory. And the reason for that is um, that maximize, that's the maximum amount you can put in a 32-bit operating system. And it also hits the feature set of ColorProof XF for Epson really well. Um, there's four CPSI modules, and each module can take advantage of one gig of memory. So by basically you know, populating to the maximum, you take advantage of you know, the best of ColorProof XF. Um, once you get beyond um, Windows XP 32, uh, Vista, thir Vista uh, 32 would be my next choice. Um, beyond that, there, are, there is um, Server 2003 and 2008. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, and that's basically for driver support. And lastly, the Mac would be my, uh, you know, OS of last resort. So, and that's probably mainly because, you know, we just, the Mac interface is just so bad with this EFI rep. I mean, they did a poor job, I think, designing some of the features yeah. versus the Windows side. Right. So. Well, and if you keep in mind, I mean, this rip was actually designed, you know, debugged and created on the XP, XP platform. So, you know, running it on what it's created for, you know you're going to get the best out of it. Sure. Um, and, you know, if you're concerned, XP boxes are still available. Dell, HP, the major, um, you know, vendors out there for PC, you know, generic hardware, um, still offer downgrades to XP, and the specialty PC builders um, will still be able to offer XP as well. So um, no reason not to do that. Um, but as Mark said, you know, don't, don't put a powerful rip and powerful printer on an old 
you know, PC. You're just not going to get the best out of it. Yeah, especially with the way this RIP can uh, just handle high-end color and, and one-bit yep. files. It's just awesome. So having a high-end PC really helps out. Uh, and then the last thing, of course, is to make sure you have a big C drive. You know, don't make a C partition with only uh, right. 150 gigabytes on it. You know, yep. go ahead and get a fast uh, SATA type drive uh, yep. and go with a terabyte drive. You know, it's not that expensive. Yep. All uh, right, so we've gone through the installer at the point where now uh, EFI wants to activate it. And as I said earlier, when you're on the internet, this is going to be real slick. Um, the dongle ID automatically get, got picked up from the USB key that we just plugged in the back of this PC. We're now going to enter our EAC code. The EAC code was given to you as part of your installation process. So I'm going to go ahead and type that in right now. You know, as Mark's typing this, he gets to the second box. Um, the one thing important about that second box is it's not going to automatically tab over. Um, so you want to kind of watch your entry. Um, and the reason for that is there's, there's other EFI software that actually uses more codes in that second box. So I'm going to go ahead and hit next step. Uh, this gives me information about how to fill out you know, information for the global registration. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit next step. Now this is cool. Um, I've already uh, installed this obviously before, so they have me on, reg on register. So if I type in my email address, and of course, uh, Larry and I are typing this in correctly right now, but on the video, I'll probably blur this out, so um, I'll get a thousand emails from people watching this. Uh, I mean, literally, I could just type all this in myself, but since I've been registered once before, I can probably hit retrieve, and the EFI database finds me and automatically populates the rest of the field. Yep. That's pretty cool. So now I just hit install license. Uh, over the internet, it automatically goes, went out, and it verified uh, everything, and it said I'm good to go, so I am finished. Um, we will talk f uh, about this on another video, but if you have more EAC codes, you can install them at this point, which means that if I bought, let's say, five or four, four or five proofing edition series SKUs, I obviously was given five dongles and five EAC codes. Well, I can use this one PC to drive, and I recommend no more than four printers, by the way, per software running. So that means I'm going to have, um, you know, three or four dongles or three dongles I won't use. But I could use those EAC codes and install them right now into the dongle I currently mm -hmm. installed. And that way I can run multiple um, printers off of one RIP interface if I wanted to off of a single uh, PC. But we'll talk about this more in another video in another day. Go ahead and hit finish. Now, it's important to note that at this point it is still installing. Um, all we did was get through the first half of the installer. At this point it looks like nothing's going on, but actually it is got a lot of stuff going on. Um, you're going to want to wait and just be patient. Don't click around um, because there are some screens that are going to come up yep. like you can see here. Hey, Mark, can I back up to manual activation for a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Mark went through the automatic uh, activation, which is great for uh, Internet-connected PC. Um, but manual activation actually can be very useful. Um, this is primarily for the installer group out there. If you're going on site um, that's not yours and you're not sure about the Internet access of the network there, um, you can pre-register and bring that license file with you. Um, during the activation, it will actually prompt you to download it and it will also allow you to email it. Um, that way when you go in, you know, you know you're not going to have any licensing issues and you're ready to go. So either verify that you're going to have internet access or do a manual download before you go on, on site. So one of the last parts of the install is we have to install all the Epson uh, media profiles. You know, one of the great parts about this RIP, and we'll talk about this more in another video, is that we've pre-fingerprinted all the Epson pro medias, and we really did a great job, Larry and I, dialing all these in for you. So they're going to all be installed at this point. Um, the setup has finished it, so we're going to hit finish here, and then it's going to start to run the automatic installer for all of our media. So again, like I said, you click on the finish button. You kind of wait here a minute. I don't know exactly why it... It kind of delays a little bit, but that's the way a lot of these Windows installers are, I guess. It's, I'm a, Mac. it's, a, it's a big DVD. It's fine in the data. I'm a Mac guy. <laughs> we don't have this issue on Mac software. Everything works quickly, but I guess Windows yeah, I, guys, I you got to wait. Don't, I don't think we should start that debate. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so it's uh, doing its thing in the background here. It's installing the wizard to install all of our Epson medias, and it's doing that now. And you are done. At this point, when you get this screen, you want to say, yes, I want to restart my computer. Uh, when we hit finish, it will restart the computer, and you have completed the raw installation. Yeah, Anything, I'd, Larry, you want to add Yeah, to I'd just like to point out a couple of things. Um, one is we now have an icon in the lower um, system tray, the basically you know two arrows in the red box. Um, that is the um, 
control center for EFI. And basically when that's, you know, after a restart, that will come up and go red. Um, the other thing we and they did, turn green. It'll turn green, sorry. Um, the other thing you'll notice is, is it put a shortcut on your desktop <clears throat> that, that um, once that's green, you can launch the client. And it also installed a program group, um, an EFI program group into your um, program folders. So I think we're ready to finish. Let's do it. Okay, so we just restarted after uh, doing the full installation of the EFI Colorproof XF RIP for Epson. Uh, at this point, I'm just going to point out a couple things, and we are done with this video. Uh, the first is you may notice that uh, the EFI uh, installation placed a shortcut of the actual client software itself. In the next video, we'll actually be launching this application and uh, giving you an overview of how to use it. Um, you can also notice that down here, there's a green box. This is the actual uh, Colorproof XF server itself. This is the control area of how you can control that server, some settings. Uh, there's going to be a separate video uh, dedicated to this kind of thing, and we'll go over this on another time. But just so you know, that's what that little area there is green. You know, sometimes when the RIP is first booting up, uh, and the PC is booting up, this icon will be not necessarily green with the arrows on it. You may see some little activity going on with this icon as the RIP is booting, as all the services are coming online. Uh, and then it goes green solid, as you see it here, when the RIP is actually running, the server is actually running. Um, and so, that means a good thing. Yeah, so you want it to be green before you launch that client. Yeah, so before you uh, launch this software here, the client, or do any work on the server, I guess yep. you want to make sure it's green. Yep. The other thing that we wanted to point out to you is at the installation, it also put uh, under your programs uh, area directory an EFI folder. Uh, the Firebird folder I put in as well. This is a database utility uh, that is required for the um, JDF uh, option that we installed. Uh, but the EFI uh, folder is the one that's kind of cool here because it gives you a really cool links folder here. And you know, Larry, um, one of the toughest parts of managing RIPs is, you know, where do I put my profiles? How do I right. install new profiles? How do I manage my three-dimensional color correction files, which we'll talk about in another video? Uh, all that stuff is quickly accessible right here from the link. So if I want to see where I put a profile for presses or anything like that, I can just go right to press profiles and I can see them. This is where I drag and drop my ICCs. Then I close it out. Uh, one of the cool things to note here is that it actually um, is a very convenient link because as you can see I quickly went there but you can see that the directory to find this location is quite large and I think Larry you told me once that yeah. this is actually a hidden directory yeah, too. Yeah if you look at that all, after all users where it says application data by default in Windows that would be a hidden folder so you'd have to go into uh, file folder options and actually turn on view hidden folders so using the links just makes everything a lot easier um, and it's easy to add additional links to folders um, that you may want to access in the future. So these are just basically the starting points for easy access and ones that you'll, we definitely know you'll need or want. And then of course the EFI XF client and the control is basically uh, the client software here and the control here, just another way to get access to those. So that completes the full installation. We are done.